Good afternoon. Um, welcome to today's talk, Deep Mapping Colonial Hobart by Philip Lamont. Um, these talks are organised by the professional historians, professional historians of Australia, Victoria and Tasmania branch, and hosted by Libraries Tasmania. Today's talk is being broadcast as a webinar, and we're pleased to welcome those people who are joining us online today. We will continue to record these talks and to make them available on Libraries Tasmania's SoundCloud. You can access Libraries Tasmania SoundCloud by clicking on the cloud icon at the bottom of the Libraries Tasmania homepage. And if you missed any of the other professional historians' talks, you can also listen to them on SoundCloud. If you haven't already done so, please switch off uh, your phones now. And before I introduce Philippa, I'd like to read to you Libraries Tasmania's acknowledgement of Tasmania's Aboriginal peoples. Uh, Libraries Tasmania recognises the deep histories and cultures of the Aboriginal people of Lutrawita, Tasmania. We acknowledge Tasmanian Aboriginal people as the traditional and continuing custodians of the land, waters and sky. We pay respect to the elders past and present who hold the memories, traditions, culture and knowledge of the country. We extend our respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples whose countries were never ceded. Uh, Philippa Moore is a writer based in Nipaluna Hobart in Lutruwita, Tasmania. She's the author of the memoir, The Latte Years, published by Nero Black Ink Books in 2016. Philippa has worked in Melbourne, London and now Hobart as a journalist, copywriter and editor. Her writing appears regularly in consumer magazines and international media, including The Guardian, Womankind, Cosmopolitan and Elle. She's currently working on a novel set in Colonial Australia as part of her PhD in Creative Writing and History at the University of Tasmania. Her PhD project received a 2023 KSP Residential Fellowship and she's the joint winner of the 2022-23 Van Diemen History Prize. In her writing and especially in her current research at UTAS, Philippa has very much enjoyed traversing the blurry borders between fiction and facts. Please join me in welcoming Philippa. much Alex um, thank you for the invitation to speak today and thank you to all of you for being here I am um, I'm so thrilled to see so many people here I had no idea so many people were coming um, so it's thank you so much for taking the time to join me today and hear about my research and my ideas and I hope you'll enjoy um, hearing what I have to say uh, first of all I'd, I'd like to echo um, Alex's acknowledgement of country See if this is where, there we go. No, back. Do bear with me. Um, I love that this act is becoming, as historian Kira Lindsay put it, an everyday act of conscious history making as it provides us with an opportunity to stop for a moment and ritualize the process of reflecting upon the legacies of the past. And so today I'm proud to acknowledge the Muwanina and Palawa peoples the traditional owners and custodians of the land we're on today and pay respect to elders past and present and just express my gratitude uh, that I live, work and write on this beautiful country that has such a proud and long storytelling tradition going back millennia. So today I've got a lot to share with you and I'm very, very excited about that. Um, I'm going to do my best to keep to time. Uh, we have started a little bit late so if anyone does need to go on the dot of two that's perfectly understandable. Um, we're going to be talking about deep mapping, which is a methodology I've been exploring and applying in my PhD research. It's a creative and multi-layered concept that has a lot of relevant application in Australia. I'm going to introduce you to Mariah, if you don't already know her, uh, and talk a bit about the methods that I've explored in how to write about her and her life, what the practice of that has looked like for me so far, and just to offer some playful possibilities about what methods can be deployed when the archival well runs dry, as it so often does after the passage of a great deal of time and the subsequent loss or destruction of so much evidence. The focus of this presentation today, as the title suggested, is Mariah's former residence and workplace, Ingle Hall, which still stands today in Hobart's Macquarie Street and has the distinction of being the oldest extant townhouse and four-storey residence in Australia, as far as I can ascertain in the records. Um, I'm going to tell you about the deep mapping journey that I've gone on. Um, 
and share a short video essay at the end, which I suppose is my creative response to the building, my, my deep map, as it were. Um, and I'm going to show you how through deep mapping, I've um, really immersed or tried to immerse myself in Mariah's world uh, to access elements of her life that have proved elusive in the historical record and show how that's assisted me in my creative practice. Um, deep mapping is, I think, a really exciting tool that's available today to researchers and creatives. Um, that invites new multi-layered possibilities, especially when you want to research a life um, that's only been lightly documented. And I conclude that place and space, if that's relevant to your subject, uh, when engaged with, can be a valuable tool for biographical revelation, even if one cannot make the same truth claim as a traditional biography. I found it can be um, incredibly fruitful as a means of connection with your subject in the absence of more literal and revealing evidence. So deep mapping is a very flexible, creative, humanist approach to research and placemaking and storytelling. So um, those of you who perhaps have a more empirical approach might raise your eyebrows a little bit, which is absolutely fine. Um, what I've explored and what I'm sharing today is admittedly a more experimental approach, and it won't be appropriate for every single historical subject. But for mine, which I think demanded a more flexible approach, it's been working very well. Um, and uh, it feels a little scary because this is the first time I've talked about my work um, in this kind of context. So I really hope you'll enjoy hearing about it. But above all, um, I'm offering my research and ideas as an invitation to what else might be possible. Um, as historian Hayden White said, it does not matter whether the world is conceived to be real or only imagined. The manner of making sense of it is the same. So. Uh, just to quickly, sorry, I just need a little water. Um, just to quickly introduce myself to those of you who don't know me, though I, I think a lot of you do. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I'm a writer based here in Hobart. I'm currently in the fourth year of my PhD in creative writing and history at UTAS, where I'm writing a historical novel based on the real life of Mariah Lord, a convict woman whose fortunes were reversed and then reversed again in quite an extraordinary way. Um, despite her many achievements during her lifetime, it, it is my opinion that she isn't as well known as she perhaps deserves to be. Kay Daniels described her as a character who has barely entered Australian history, unlike her contemporary Mary Ryby. If things had been different, perhaps it would be Mariah's face on the $20 note. So I hope my project will go some way in redressing this. Um, this is something I'm really passionate about, um, shining a light on the lives of women who are historically um, obscure and who, as a result of not having a significant archive or not having left anything behind in their own words to, to tell us who they really were, um, their stories are not as much part of the dominant public narrative as they could be. Um, so I'm really interested in how to write about these women in creative and provocative ways and that have relevance and resonance for, for how we live now. Um, one of the aims of my PhD, um, which is comprised of the novel and a contextualising critical commentary, is actually to demonstrate how contemporary women are still grappling with the issues that Mariah faced 200 years ago. Um, I've always loved history. I've always loved writing. Um, I have a background in non-fiction, as Alex said. Um, but I've always wanted to write fiction. So what I'm doing now is a, an absolute dream come true, to put it mildly. Um, and the reason for the picture at the bottom is uh, I used to do um, a lot of long distance running um, in my 20s and 30s, which I now view as excellent preparation for my PhD studies, um, or just writing a historical novel in general, because you need stamina and a great capacity for endurance. Um, just to indulge the metaphor a tiny bit more, I'm at the equivalent of mile 19 of um, my PhD. Uh, and to be honest, when I ran the London Marathon in 2011, this is the bit I don't remember. So <laughs> who knows? The end is in sight, but these were definitely the hardest miles. So I've got to keep putting one foot in front of the other for a little while longer. So on to the main event. Between 1811 and 1814, a house was built on Hobart's Macquarie Street. This one here. Over 200 years later, it is still standing. Known as Ingle Hall since the late 1890s, it was the residence of Edward and Mariah Lord from roughly 1816 to 1823. The Lords were Hobart Town's power couple of the day. 
they were the wealthiest citizens of the colony. They owned extensive properties with large quantities of livestock, cargo brigs and retail enterprises, effectively controlling Van Diemen's Land's meat, wheat and rum trades. Maria had primary management of the bulk of their concerns, including a general store and a warehouse, which were also located at Ingle Hall. And Maria was also a former convict, which was something it seemed no one would let her forget. So Mariah Risley was born in 1778 in the small rural village of Spaldwick in Huntingdonshire, England. I have some pictures of it. There we go. Sorry about that. Um, I was fortunate enough to go there last year, and this is what it looks like today. I mean, so as you can see, it's quite an idyllic um, rural English village. Um, it's still very quiet and it's um, it's in the middle of nowhere. So how she ended up here um, is, is really quite a story. Um, she came to Australia in 1804 as a convict, serving a seven year sentence for stealing goods from her employer. This is a muster um, in 1804, the year she arrived. And let me just see the pointer, so this is, her mention there, and you can see the 9th of August 1802 was when she was tried, seven years, and it was the Surrey Assizes. Um, so initially, Mariah was assigned as a domestic servant when she arrived in Sydney, um, but she was pregnant within a few months and sent back to Parramatta Jail. Things looked pretty grim. She had no money or prospects, and it was likely she'd have to give up her child to an orphanage. But her fortunes changed rapidly when Edward Lord, a rising star in the government in Van Diemen's land, arrived at the jail seeking a wife. She agreed to set sail with him and her child to Hobart Town, where a new and very different life awaited. And I have to say at this juncture that for Mariah to have married a prominent man like Edward was not only fortunate for her for a while at least, um, but for someone like me trying to write about her 200 years later. I sometimes wonder if uh, Mariah had married John Thompson, the father of her first child, Caroline, she might well have vanished forever. Edward Lord was acting governor of Van Diemen's Land following the death of David Collins, and he had great ambitions in the acquisition of wealth and power. As a government officer, he wasn't permitted to trade, but Mariah could, using all of Edward's connections and advantages. She set up a general store in Hobart, and she proved herself to be a very skilled and capable businesswoman. Mariah and Edward lived together openly for a few years, welcoming two more children, one of which sadly died in infancy. And in 1808, Mariah received an absolute and unconditional pardon from Joseph Baveau, the Lieutenant Governor of Norfolk Island, and she and Edward were officially married in Hobart shortly after that. Over the next 13 years, five more children joined the family and Mariah expanded and controlled most, if not all, of their business ventures, which flourished. She handled day-to-day -day transactions and Edward was the negotiator, either buttering up the right people in power or trying to, he wasn't particularly well liked, um, or taking long trips back to England, returning with their ships filled with desirable wares to sell in their stores. Edward and Mariah were also very much at the centre of Hobart Town society. They regularly threw balls and they hosted visiting dignitaries from New South Wales and abroad and all of their children were sent to England to be educated as soon as they were old enough. But Edward's long absences, often for years at a time, would have taken a toll on their marriage. And despite her pardon, her marriage to a powerful, well-connected man, and becoming one of the colony's wealthiest and most successful women in the process, evidence suggests that Mariah was never fully accepted by society. Even after she was pardoned, William Bly still referred to her as a convict woman of infamous character, and many years later, in the early 1820s, new arrivals to Hobart Town were scandalised that Mr Lord, the wealthiest man in the colony, was married to a convict woman. Despite her incredible success, or maybe even because of it, it seemed people were just waiting for Mariah to fall from grace. In 1824, Hobart Town was rocked by a scandal that tore the couple apart. 46-year-old Mariah had an affair with a man 20 years her junior. Edward sued his wife's lover in open court, won, and quit the colony to live permanently back in England, though he did make the occasional trip out here over the next 35 years. 
Mariah lived quietly in Tasmania until she died in 1859. Now, when I first heard about Mariah, quite by chance in my early 20s, thanks to a friend who was researching someone else and then made a Tasmanian connection, as you do, um, I was astounded that I was hearing about this remarkable sounding woman for the very first time. Um, despite being born and raised here and um, being a bit of a, considering myself a bit of a history buff to boot, um, I had actually never heard of her until that point, and nor had anyone else I mentioned her to. And while some scholars had paid her some attention, most of them were also puzzled by the deliberate silence of the public record. This is from Convict Women by Kay Daniels. And so Mariah is not absent from the his historical record, but she's not easy to get to know. As Kay Daniels wrote here, she didn't leave anything behind to reveal her inner life, her thoughts and feelings about the people she knew, what it was like to be separated from her children when they were all taken to England to be educated. Most of them she never saw again. Um, and then the very public breakdown of her marriage. Um, there's also no portrait, nothing to show what she physically looked like. There is a lot of evidence about um, her business activities um, and to prove her astuteness in business, as she described herself here. Um, in a paper a year after the scandal. And there's also a handful of business letters and legal documents in her own handwriting that contain her signature. This is one I found in Sydney, which you see here. But there's, there was seemingly nothing I could find containing any element of candour to show who she really was. Mariah isn't alone in this space. Many women in 19th century Australia who were actually very visible to their contemporaries have faded from the dominant historical narrative in present day. Uh, Catherine Bishop's excellent book here, Minding Her Own Business, Colonial Business Women in Sydney, also um, considers this idea and cites Australia's long acceptance of a masculinist national story as one of the reasons it was generally accepted by historians that women largely disappeared from public commercial life, with the notable exception of Mary Ryby, of course. Um, Bishop's research is really fascinating and demonstrates that despite the well-worn tropes that have really dogged the subjectivities of Australian colonial women for centuries, there's a great deal of evidence to show that women in 19th century Sydney, at least, didn't look on from the sidelines, but were right in the thick of the main game. Um, and they, they often sit uncomfortably between different strands of history. They push the boundaries, but that wasn't always by choice. And Mariah, living and working in Van Diemen's Land, was the same. She was right in the thick of the main game. But Bishop mostly concentrates on the second half of the 19th century, and Mariah was living and working in Hobart in the first half of it much longer ago, probably more likely that records simply haven't survived or perhaps were even destroyed. Edward did have a reputation for doing that, apparently, so she has been harder to pin down. My initial primary objective for my project was to find the real Mariah. But as time went on, it became clear that adopting a really strict biographical approach wasn't going to work for me. Reliance on Mariah's small archive in comparison to, say, her husband's was only going to get me so far in attempting to tell her story. I really wanted and needed the freedom to imagine Mariah's actions, thoughts and emotions, while maintaining the integrity of what I was able to discern from the historical record. Therefore, the use of fiction within the biographic space became the most appropriate method for me to attempt to tell Mariah's story, as it is a, uh, to quote uh, literary scholar James Vickers, a space in which lost lives can be recovered and rediscovered. I'm sure many of you know Inga Clendinen's famous, much discussed 2006 quarterly essay, The History Question, in which she argued that history and fiction are on opposite sides of a ravine. So, I realise that places me in a rather contentious position, and I am aware of that. But I have come to appreciate that historical fiction and hybrid forms such as speculative biography can achieve great strides in the negotiation of ar archival silence. The novel I'm writing is probably closest to this concept, fictional biography, which has at its goal a fuller, more vivid and intimate sense of the subject person than the facts can relate. My novel reimagines the life and inner world of Mariah, drawing on documentable evidence where it exists, both to inform the narrative and to call attention to how women's histories are written or indeed not written. It would be fair to say that until fairly recently, 
Australia suffered from, to quote Babette Smith, a major distortion of its convict history, where the initial flourishing of a society that included convicts and allowed them to build successful lives as citizens was mostly forgotten by the early 20th century. So it isn't entirely surprising, perhaps, that Mariah and countless women like her faded from public view over time. I'm really glad to say this imbalance has been significantly redressed since I first became interested in Mariah's story, particularly by many female historians in this country who have re-engaged with this period and uncovered fascinating stories of women who were previously all but lost. Uh, these are a handful of recent examples, all non-fiction or certainly marketed that way, um, that I particularly loved and that demonstrate, I think, the individual historian's tenacity in recovering these overlooked and very interesting lives and how it's possible, as Kira Lindsay put it, to write historically grounded work that tastes like fiction. Um, there's also this excellent book. Uh, as far as I know, it may be the only one published since 2005 that does focus on Mariah and her significant contribution um, to the establishment of Tasmania as we know it today and which interrogates the histor historical record admirably for all possible traces of her. Um, Alison Alexander has also made full use of the surrounding historical and cultural context of the early days of Van Diemen's Land as well. So it makes for fascinating reading this one. Um, Alexander acknowledges to the sparse nature of Mariah's archive and occasionally even makes her own speculations as to what may have transpired where there are gaps in the official record. But even corruption and skullduggery, as thorough as it is, does acknowledge its limitations in that who Mariah and Edward Lord truly were and the undoubtedly complex nature of their characters is almost impossible to determine because so little written by them survives. Even Mariah's name is sometimes hard to find. The links between her and the businesses and family she created faded, worn thin, even violently severed. As you can see here, um, this is from the, the library's collection. This is her son John's journal. Over here, something has literally been cut out. Um, of course, I can't prove that it was her name that was written there, but it seems logical to me, given that um, Mariah and her son John, they were eventually buried together out in New Norfolk. And this also seems emblematic of how information about and links to convict ancestors were still being erased at a personal and family level well into the 20th century. For someone who played such an interesting role in the founding of Tasmania as we know it today, it felt reasonable to me that Mariah's story should be more well known. And on a personal level, I identified so strongly with her, with this woman who appeared to be to have been greatly misunderstood and underestimated during her life, who had displayed so much courage and resilience in the face of hardship and prejudice, who had never been granted absolution from her past mistakes. I was moved to find a way to make her life and achievements more visible. And because I wanted to know her, it followed that whatever I did should be based on as much of the truth, which in itself is always subjective, as I could find. But after nearly a year, I still had only the same few facts to go on. And you know, when you're doing a PhD, you start to panic a bit when that happens. So this challenging realization prompted me to undertake a wider and more experimental approach to my historical research for my novel. I was really inspired by the work of Australian scholars like Donna Lee Bryan and Kira Lindsay, who've done a lot of fascinating work in creative history where, uh, to quote them, historical research is brought into conversation with creative practice to provoke new methods and push disciplinary boundaries to allow for deeper truths and new questions. And I've also been really inspired by Anne Kurtois and John Docker, who wrote this in their excellent book, Is History Fiction? Um, and I really see myself working in, in this space, in a space that's inventive and self-transforming. Um, and I hope I'm creating a work that's very much grounded in archival research, uh, that I hope is pleasurable to read and accessible and that helps people to think about Mariah either for the first time or in a new way. I'm not trying to rewrite history, just disturb it slightly, repositioning this particular woman's experiences. So on to Ingle Hall. This was the moment the project became truly alive for me. I stopped looking for Mariah in the library and turned my attention and curiosity to the streets of Hobart and beyond. 
The more I walked, observed and listened, the more I realised that places and buildings can also be historical evidence, archives unto themselves. They can leave clues and ask questions that have many or no answers. Echoes of Mariah are everywhere in Hobart as we know it today, and the most notable in my experience resonate from Ingle Hall. Uh, like I mentioned, I was really lucky last year um, to widen the geographical scope of my search for Mariah when I made an unexpected visit to her birthplace, um, as well as what remains of the old jail in London. Oh, no, that one. So this is what remains of the um, Horsemonger Lane Jail in, um, in London. And we visited that and that's Edwards Grove there. We had to pour water on it and we had to pull a tree off it as well because it's um, quite <laughs> overgrown and hasn't been visited for some time. But in contrast to Mariah's memorial in New Norfolk, um, I've been to various sites in Sydney and Parramatta as well, um, relevant sites around Tasmania, including Bothwell and New Norfolk, but I kept returning to the White House on Macquarie Street as the epicentre for where Mariah as a literary character, as well as a historical figure, began to be formed for me. And as such, I'll be uh, concentrating on Ingle Hall today to illustrate my methodological approach. Here at the Tasmanian Archives and Heritage Office, Ingle Hall actually has a thicker, hall, a thicker file than Mariah herself. But like Mariah, there are many unknowns and overlaps, many conflicting stories and convoluted beginnings. It's never been firmly established whether the original house was built by Edward Lord or his friend John Ingle, nor the exact year it was constructed. The story of Ingle Hall is also a story of transition, transformation and shape-shifting. Its truest beginnings are even harder to confidently discern because, of course, the site would have been something else entirely prior to the arrival of the Europeans. Nipaluna Hobart was already home to the Muwanea and Palawa Pakana peoples, and the proxim proximity of the river to the site where Ingle Hall now stands might have meant that people regularly set up home nearby to enjoy the resources of the water according to the season. There is evidence that sophisticated land management practices were in place and therefore the site of what is now Ingle Hall and the land surrounding it would have been carefully cultivated and managed in a systematic fashion, creating fresh water and food sources for the people and seasonally controlled with fire. Um, just quoting there from an excellent book, uh, The Biggest Estate on Earth, How Aborigines Made Australia by Bill Gamage. Highly recommend that if you want to seek that out. But historians have concurred that the land where Ingle Hall was eventually built in around 1812, which is find it on the map is here. So according to the legend here, um, number two was granted to John Ingle, but right next door was granted to Edward. And he did like making his own rules. Um, but they have concurred that it was most likely granted to John Ingle. And since its construction, the condition, fabric and structure of Ingle Hall has been continually altered to accommodate various uses. It has been, among many other things, a brothel, a temperance hotel, coffee palace, as you see here, this is about 1900, a children's library, a gynaecologist's office, the original site of the Hutchins School, uh, for those of us joining from elsewhere, um, Hutchins is a private boys' school in Hobart. Uh, the Mercury offices, a museum, as well as a residential dwelling. Architectural studies of the building in the 1990s described elements of Georgian and Victorian period fabric and their condition at key points between 1814 and 1998. While the original exterior is very much intact, in 2016, Sashona Proprietary Limited did a report on its condition and fabric, which determined that only the interiors of the basement, the display office room and the long room on ground level, the schoolroom bedroom on the mid level, and the attic level bedroom in the southeast corner were original. Under its current custodianship, Ingle Hall has become an experimental amalgam of public and private dwelling and workplace heritage preservation and contemporary occupation. In many respects, it has been restored to its first purpose. It's a place of business as well as a home, as it was for Mariah. The present occupiers have honoured and preserved Ingle Hall's historical integrity, but they've also transformed it for modern living. In my own visits to the building, I've come to share Julian Worrell's assessment when he wrote about it for Architecture Australia, that the multitude and fluidity of Ingle Hall's structure and purposes over its historical lifespan have been compressed into a single moment. 
Being there, I feel I am in the past and the present simultaneously. Within its walls, I have experienced firsthand how the previous inhabitants can vanish, leaving only a few traces, yet how the house was experienced by them remains alive. So on to deep mapping. This proved an intriguing concept to apply to my inquiries, as deep maps are not confined to the tangible or the material, but include the discursive and ideological dimensions of place, the dreams, hopes and fears of residents. They are, in short, positioned between matter and meaning. Uh, I'm going to try and give a potted definition of this in the interest of time. Um, the term deep map probably came into use in the 1970s in the distinctive travel writing of William Least Heat Moon. It is the subtitle of his detailed multi-layered account of a small patch of the Kansas grasslands called Prairie Earth. But there's evidence to suggest that deep mapping as a concept has actually been around since the 18th century as this, um, sorry for the block of text, but I just thought it was very interesting to share. Um, this introduction from David Bodenheimer um, in a very comprehensive volume about deep mapping that came out last year um, asserts, um, you know, this impulse towards contextualisation, um, the idea of city encyclopedias that have in fact been uh, put together for centuries. In fact, we have a wonderful one that's available digitally here at the State Library called the Cyclopedia of Tasmania, published in, I think, about 1900. Is that right, Clifford? Yeah? Yes. Um, I've seen the project many times. <laughs> I haven't seen it in person. I've only looked at it digitally, but it is amazing. So anyone who's interested in, um, you know, sort of Victorian era historiography, um, I would really recommend checking that out. You know, just gathering up the history and the statistics that were available at that time. It's a fascinating document. And then, of course, we have theatre practice scholars who are interested in the idea of creating work where the past feels like it's unfolding in real time. You know, these are all really interesting elements of this methodology. What is a deep map? It's a detailed multimedia depiction of a place and all that exists within it, not strictly tangible, includes emotion and meaning. It's a process and a product, creative, visual, open, multi-layered, ever-changing, where traditional map service statements, deep maps serve as conversations. And I really like um, this definition as well from Maureen Engel. Um, I mean, again, just this idea of opening up to questions, having a conversation with all the layers of a location that hold human history, memories, connections, energies, voices, identities and narratives. It is immersion in a fundamentally subjective space where both the historical and the contemporary can be explored. It's a, a growing area of interest in Australian humanities as well, and it's been used by many other scholars to reimagine relationships to place. Professor Margaret Somerville, um, who's a real pioneer of Australian place studies, has also explored deep mapping as a valuable practice to bring Indigenous and non-Indigenous perspectives together with the aim of representing past relationships and contemporary stories and re-inscribing stories of deep time, a time that exists in the present as well as the geological past. Uh, deep mapping is also a very useful tool for educators particularly in rethinking colonial relationships and settler histories, ensuring that students have access to different realities, stories and worldviews, and can see how these can coexist. I think it would be fair to say that thanks to technology, more and more data is being integrated into our contemporary experience of a place. And I think it's really heartening that a methodology like deep mapping that allows for multitudes, for more nebulous phenomena, um, has been explored and even embraced by so many disciplines within the humanities, not least because its scope and its flexibility are a real natural fit for history, stories and places that have ancient and sacred pasts that have defied the bounds of conventional historiography. Hence, in Australia, deep mapping is gaining more traction, interest and relevance with every passing year. And I just want to give a quick shout out to the Research Centre for Deep History at ANU in Canberra. That was established in 2019. And I think that's a really solid example of how the collaborative nature and principles of deep mapping are being integrated into contemporary historical practice. Um, in this case, assisting in expanding history's time scale and scope to better appreciate the full human history of Australia which goes back some 65,000 years and situate it more appropriately in a global context. 
The centre has a fundamentally transdisciplinary approach, which includes working with Indigenous knowledge custodians, scientists, archaeologists, historians, and many other relevant experts. And at this very moment, I understand the centre is working on this, a very innovative digital mapping project called Marking Country. It began as a digital atlas, but evolved to capture the layers that the gathering of locational data revealed. And I'm certainly looking forward to when they launch that. Um, so yeah, there's, there's some really interesting work being done in this space. Um, and it has so many other interesting applications like cultural heritage, urban renewal, that sort of thing. So in my PhD thesis, I'm exploring the concept for its potential to assist creative practitioners in the construction of narratives that take place in the past and where the subject's lives have only been lightly documented. How we might search for a person in the spaces they inhabited that still exist beyond what might physically have been left behind. How we might dive within, as the filmmaker and transcendental, transcendental meditator David Lynch might put it. But big question, of course, how is this actually going to work in practice? There's a lot of scholarship on the topic, but I haven't really found an instruction manual for how to do a deep map. How could I combine the obvious strengths of geographic understanding with the focus on the ineffable, the irreducible and the particular? And most importantly, to quote Hugh Trevor Roper, how can one possibly do this so the result is readable? So at present, Ingle Hall is both a home and a workplace, much like it was for Mariah, and the current inhabitants have gone to great trouble to preserve all the original features they could find. After boldly knocking on the door one day in September 2020 and being very warmly received, I have been privileged to return on many occasions since. And on one visit, I was invited to view the basement, which is one of the few remaining original features of the house, and it's where Edward and Mariah had their general store in around 1816. And according to this advertisement, they had seven casks of Virginia leaf tobacco out the back. So on this visit, I was shown to the entrance to the hidden basement, which had a staircase leading down underground, a bit like a bunker in a way. I could hardly contain my excitement, as I'm sure you can imagine. Inside, it was dim, hardly surprising for a basement space. Light only entered the space from two small windows on the Argyle Street side. Centuries of dust, cobwebs and dead insects gathered in piles on the sills. The floor was covered with a thick, moist sand, almost like paste, which got trapped in every crevice of the soles of my boots, and a tiny portion, as you see here, of the original river stone floor has also been preserved. I could ignore the cold air, the mushroomy dampness, as I turned my attention to the fireplaces and imagined the shop with Mariah running it. Carefully displayed and selected goods for sale, all retaining the sense of the countries they came from, perhaps a warm fire going in each grate and a clean river stone floor. And uh, the stock room out the back filled with hanging meats and perhaps the Virginia leaf tobacco as they had advertised. Every part of me tingled with the knowledge that I was standing somewhere Mariah also had two centuries earlier. I've been very honoured and privileged to be able to do some actual writing at Ingle Hall too, thanks to the generosity of Timothy Hill and his colleagues. In my own office, I usually write with music, but at Ingle Hall, I listen to the house. I look out of the windows onto Macquarie Street through glass that is so old it has thickened with time and slightly distorted the view as a result. I walk about the room that I'm in that day to get a sense for what kind of pace I can comfortably do and how former inhabitants might have moved about. I've crouched to take photographs of the handmade nails, their heads long and flat in the original floorboards. I note the way the stairs sound when someone walks up or down them, imagining the echo of shoes, feet, voices, traveling up and down the swishing and scratching of long skirts on the floorboards 200 years ago. Being able to sit in Mariah's former home, what might've been her parlor or her living room has been a deeply intimate experience, and I'm so grateful to the current owners for facilitating that for me. So when considering what form my own deep map might take, 
in addition to my novel, I've continued in the spirit of creativity and experimentation, and I've created a deep map that is a video essay of various visual sources related to Ingle Hall that I've collected over the last few years. And if time allows, I will play that for you now. Just like to um, make special mention of my darling husband who helped me put that together and he also wrote the music um, that you heard over the top. Um, we're just about at the end now. So um, throughout the process of deep mapping Ingle Hall, it didn't surprise me that I've unearthed more stories, more unknown lives. With each visit, as I strain my ears to hear traces of Mariah, another voice inevitably pipes up and asks me to tell their story too. Every time I sit down to write in the house, I am overwhelmed by the number of lives it has seen and held, and why and how only some are remembered, the rest swallowed up simply by time. Despite making great strides and feeling better acquainted with Mariah, there were no lost memoirs found behind a bookcase or a hidden portrait under the floorboards of Ingle Hall. The romantic in me so wanted that to happen. And if I were a novelist seeking convenient narrative closure, I might have freely invented such things. But instead, Mariah remains, strictly speaking, a mystery. However, my engagement with her former home and workplace, the sight of so many important moments in her life has really helped me to understand her more. She is now a three-dimensional person to me, a character I can see and hear. I have sat in the rooms of Ingle Hall alone with modern life happening all around me, 
and felt the loneliness and longings of the woman who lived there two centuries ago, felt her ambition and drive, her anguish and her humiliation at her mistakes. Developing this approach has helped me understand that just because a name or a likeness is not committed to paper, or if it was, it no longer exists, that does not signify that these people are unreachable and unknowable 200 years later. What at first seemed fanciful now feels like a methodology with a solid scholarly basis from which the stories of many more unknown and overlooked people from history might be able to be told. And I think we're in a really exciting time where we can think about and explore the past and the lesser documented lives of the people who lived in it in different, inclusive and creative ways. Thank you very much. If, if, uh, if people have to go, that's absolutely fine. You're very welcome to contact me um, via my website, philippamore.net. There's a contact form there. I'm happy to send the references that I mentioned to anyone who's interested. And, uh, yeah, come up and talk to me afterwards if you like. Thank you so much for being here. And thank you to people who've joined us online.